Rogers, and this is Thoughts on Art. This will be the first one, and I'll uh, hopefully I'll introduce you to what I have in mind, as if I knew what I had in mind. But uh, we're going to be covering things mostly about art. Now, this is going to probably go into areas that you're not expecting. This is not a, a how-to on art, how to paint this, how to draw that. Uh, there be, if there is something like that, that would be fairly occasional. I figure there's plenty of things out here on the internet, YouTube and otherwise, to cover how to draw something or how to paint something or different things. This is probably more, not just theoretical things about art, there will be some things like that. Why certain things are done, why certain things aren't done. But actually a lot of this will be more fundamental about where artists started. What really is the foundations of making images. A lot of what I'll be dealing with is not really so much about art. As a, I would like the definition more about making images. Some will be about art. Ultimately it will be about art, but a lot of times it's fundamentally more just about image creation. And it may surprise you as to the sorts of things and areas that that goes into, like actually language and language development is very much tied with image making. Art is very tied to how we speak, the things we speak about, language development, mathematics. Mathematics is just another language. We have tons of languages. And in fact, human beings are very good at creating languages. Art is one of the ways, or image making is one of the tools that we use for creating languages. And then of course, for tuning up things, for making more concise languages for describing things, for talking about uh, things that have happened, things that may happen, past tense, propositions for the future, all that sort of things that we usually talk about are actually founded or directly tied with the very fundamental nature of making images. Art itself is used in making things like <clears throat> written language, spoken language. If there wasn't any image making, we couldn't make the little symbols for creating any kind of written language. Those are directly tied to spoken language, but spoken language is a more fundamental than written languages. When you get into things like written language, we go into places like mathematics. Mathematics are just little pictures. A language made with mathematical, it's a certain idea about how to describe things. Just like we think of art as being fundamental to describing things. Image making is about describing things. All these things are tied together. And we'll cover different kinds of things different ideas, different theories, whatever thoughts about art, about image making. And to start off, I just want to let you know where this is probably going to go and where it comes from. The very fundamentals of image making can show up in things like as human beings, we are tied to tool making. And actually, the fundamental processes we use for tool making, say with stone napping, you look at a stone and a human being envisions what that can look like, what is there and what can be there. And that, pro that process of imaging that thing, imagining that, is the process that starts image making. So tool making and image making 
are directly tied together. There is, and of course, a lot of these things are not a, I don't care if it's tool making, image making, language. We tend to think of things in very linear terms, that this happened and that happened and then this other thing came about. I think that that's usually an erroneous way to think about things. They're usually more spontaneous. These things, there's not necessarily a, this, a chicken egg scenario. There isn't this thing and then that thing. The things sort of grow out of each other. One thing happens and another thing happens. What happens first would be ambiguous. It'd be hard to say most of the time. And it doesn't really matter because the next thing that happens came out of the last thing, maybe. But they actually came out of a process that we responded to something that already happened. And how we respond can be visual, can be auditory, can be a combination of those kinds of, uh, of things. And so when we're talking about human beings, we're sort of uh, language factories. We develop languages all the time, repeatedly. And that's why there's a lot of languages. Strangely enough, though, there's not always just the right language in just the right circumstances. So we're always having to create more. We always have to create more language. So there we're having to create more image. This is why images never grow stale. We're always coming up with new images, new mathematics, new ideas. All these things grow out of each other. And that's why I want to concentrate on image making fundamental, fundamentally and art as a whole. And that's what we want to start off this program with. And we'll take different subjects. There'll be a lot of bouncing this way, bouncing that way. And hopefully you can um, we'll enjoy hanging in there with it. Maybe it'll stimulate you to think about things in a different way than you thought about before. I certainly plan on things being that way for me. I have taught art at various levels over the years. And there has been times when people would ask me, what do, you, what do you get out of it? And I may get more out of it than most of the students. They're not always students. A lot of, it's hard to talk about some of these people that I've engaged in art projects with as being students. Uh, and yet at the same time, we're all students. And that's one of the things that some of my quote students don't understand is I'm a student and they're doing a lot of the work for me. When there's a room full, there's five, there's ten people and they're doing things. They're, and I have them say there's an assignment. And what the assignment really is, is I'm curious about something, how they're going to deal with the something. And so I'm not teaching them to do something. They're teaching me how to do something. There are different responses or ways that I can learn different ways that people respond. I have reactions to that. I can sometimes guide them into understanding their own responses in ways that may help them be more creative about their responses. And hopefully, in this entire series of things that we go on here, it'll be that way for you, and I should certainly expect it to be that way for me.
get the side of it. Yeah, yeah. Say that again. I'll put um, a large drawing. See, this one's on a canvas, that one's on a canvas because it's easier to move them around. Instead of pinning them and taping them all over the place, mm -hmm. you just tape them on the canvas one time. You can flip them around, you can do whatever you want. So it keeps them more mobile. So. You've seen the rest of the studio, didn't you? Uh, over there? No, I haven't seen the rest of the studio over there. In here? No, over at the uh, Clinton County Arts Center. Mm. So I dug out some old sketches. These are old work. sketches of yours? Yeah. Skeletons? Yeah. <laughs> Figures, because it'll be a live drawing class, you know, it'll be like a uh, new model kind of thing. But anyway, yes. this is where, and this is my table that I have my drawing stuff on. And I'll be moving it in there once I get things arranged more. Yeah. In the space, stuff like that. Can you show me the paintings over here? These are not mine, but I'm glad you showed them. Okay. Ah. Is it, which more one's board, boring art? More boring board, boring art. Boring art. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Whoa. Whoa. All your whole space, you got all this. Yeah. Too? Yeah. Now, you know this. Now, uh, outside, those two spaces down in there, uh, John Cassie's keeping his stuff in there. He was pretty proud. I've got plenty of room. So. Hmm. So you've got um, a mandrel. You're working with. Yeah. Yeah. Let him. It's ink drawing. Pen and ink. But somebody else's art is in here. Down at the. Those two sections down there. Uh -huh. This thing down. Is yes. That? John Cassidy. Oh. And. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Working a lot with pastels and stuff. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Be careful with that one because it's not yeah, fixed. Yeah, I saw that. No, I mean not. That's fine. This is not fixed, yeah. right? I mean, it's really. It has a great... Right. Yeah. Yeah, this is the one. Yeah, you seem to. Song for sleeping dog. Now, you did a song for the sleeping dog oil one too. That's right. right. I actually right. did this first and did the oil painting. Which one? An intaglio, right? Yeah, that's an intaglio. Okay, and then you did the oil second. Right, and in the, his list of stuff, so they're did you both call this? in there. Okay, so this isn't a study for... No. Office. This is an actual completed work. Yeah, that's the whole yeah, thing all to itself. Okay. So that's the original? And yeah. Who did this? There was actually a little sketch that I did. And from the sketch, I did that, and then the oil. Did you ask? This about? is John's stuff. Yeah, okay, that's this what I is thought. Pastels. So it's like a dividing line right here. Well, actually, the dividing lines over there, but things get spread out. Okay. So, uh. so the one that's called Oink. Yeah. Uh, it's new. Oh. See, see, there was another thing. See, hmm. I was going through my a bunch of drawings and stuff a few months back, and. There was a tablet that had some stuff in it. 
and in that tablet, I didn't even remember this stuff, was the original sketch that I'd done for this. Well, I to told that. him is he probably... Well, light on this one. Yeah. Well, let's see here. And who do you say this uh, girl was made? Deborah Reisberg. Deborah Reisberg. I have no idea who she is. Maybe I'll learn from her. She, uh, she has the. Uh, could you grab the cord? Deborah owns Main Street Yoga, the yoga center. Ah. Ergo, yoga poses. Ah. Let's see, what's with the goat? Two Not goats. goats. The muscots. Muscots? Yeah. Yeah, what are. Okay, that's a muscot. They hang around in the snow. Being musky. <laughs> this is totally bored. Just determined a few minutes ago its name because we looked at Oink. Yeah. Ah. Point is over there on the wall. Okay. The original? Yeah, or no? The original, right? Or one of them. I think it's a. I, I can't we, remember. Well, I think we got. We have the proof. That's, that's a proof factor. Oh, that's the proof. That's an artist proof right there. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, that painting there is somebody else's, right? On the top? No, it's mine. That's like that's... in Charles Reinhardt looking like. No, not really. No? But we were on a painting trip together. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh. And uh, no, really, his would be a whole lot different a than that. A whole different than that? Yeah. yeah. It'd be like. Well, I can't see it. Well, let's see. There's better light. Yeah. You can see the sort of difference. I think we have the other three pictures that go with this bottom one here. Yeah. That's right. And where is that from? The. That was at Forest uh, Park? No, no. Uh, Botanical Missouri Garden. Botanical Garden. Botanical Garden. Yeah, it does look like I think I remember can picture where that's at. What about uh, the circus over here? It actually was not a circus, it was a uh, theater tent at the uh, Summer Theater, University of Missouri, Springfield. Hmm. That's kind of in the back. What you're seeing is the back of some bleachers. Ah. Did you go in and see, or were you just outside the whole time? I was out there painting. Hmm. Yeah. Are these uh, Midwestern scenes, like that one, the tent, or was that somewhere else? No, that was in Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri. So a lot of your art has been created in the Midwest? Mostly. Almost what about the, um, the ones that John is uh, doing the paper on? Were all, those called? All those were almost exclusively all done. Those mid. were all done. In the uh, in Springfield, Missouri, St. Louis, are here. Hmm. Okay. And then, um, was the dates right that he has for those paintings, or did I, you correct I wrote those? Down he wrote okay. down the list. Mostly in uh, kind of the mid 80s. Oh, okay. Early to mid 80s or something. Okay, like so that. the late 70s, early 80s? No, none of those happened to be in the 70s. Oh. I've done some things like that in the 70s, but none of those. None of those? Yeah. And was all of them oil and Italios and one watercolor, or was any yes. of them? So that's. Have you ever There's worked? No with acrylic. With acrylic ever? So long ago I just scratched it off. Yeah, like was that in the seventies when it was popular? Yeah, it was actually it had nothing to do with popularity. It just cost. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to work with oil. So oh. I, I just didn't know how to do it. It was a disaster. So uh, and uh, but so I I started working with acrylic. I was mostly working with watercolors at, at the time, watercolors and drawing. Mm -hmm. All right. That's what I uh, for some paintings, for some paintings like what your stuff you're looking at, the first several of those I did was in acrylic, but the acrylic was uh, was a real struggle 
it, at least at that time, the acrylics didn't mix properly color-wise, and uh, I ended up going back to oils when I found somebody that actually could, showed me how to use them properly, how to make mediums for them and stuff like that. Do you know who that someone was? Charles Reinhardt. Charles Reinhardt. Yeah. Uh, romantic landscape painter, probably the finest living romantic landscape painter in the world. Hmm. And uh, him and his wife, Levita, who's also a really great painter, uh, spent a lot of time with them. We go off doing plein air painting and stuff like that. And he taught me the technical things, like how to make mediums and stuff and mm -hmm. things like that for the oils to make them work fun. How long would it take to make one oil? Because they take a long time, don't they? No, no, no. It's all over the map. I mean, it's like I've done... Oh, I've done like four foot by five foot oils in just a few hours. Totally complete. Hmm. I mean, I, there's a couple of them like that. Other things may take weeks, may take months. Just. It just depends on a lot of things. You know? When did you do that self-portrait over there? It would have been about uh, 1987, something like that. 1987. Yeah. What it is, is the self-portrait. You need to grab the cord, though. There's a, a famous painting by Lamont of the artist Duran. They were hanging out together doing stuff and he painted this painting of Duran and it's, it looks like that except it's Duran instead of me. So I really liked it because of the green and everything. So it's a self-portrait that I did of me but in the manner that Lamont had done his portrait of Duran. Let's see. You just made it extremely wobbly. You know what it is? Yeah. It's, it's a great picture of him standing and talking. The light was great. <laughs> but anyway, so that's that's what that painting is. Just uh, I like doing a lot of different stuff, and uh, mm -hmm. that's one of the stuff that I like to do. With. And uh, there was. A, you notice that painting, the self-portrait on the wall at the coffee house? Yeah. Now that was after seeing, I was looking at a lot of those self-portraits by Rembrandt, who was doing self-portraits all the time. The point of self-portraits are, is you're an easy, cheap model. You can, you're always around yourself, so you don't have to like hire a model, you don't have to do anything, you just pull out the mirror, sit down and paint. And so, anyway, that was in, you know, like I said, I'd been looking at a lot of Rembrandt self-portraits, and so I did one in sort of a Rembrandt style. Yeah. What about all your nudes? I know you have a lot of nudes you painted. Do you, who inspired that? Uh, it's not exactly inspired. I would go to, uh, when I was in college, I would have life drawing classes, but even before and after that, I would usually go to colleges or community art centers or something like that mm -hmm. where they would have models and uh, just to do live sketches. Now some of them are oil paintings but a mm -hmm. lot of them are, are drawings of pencil and charcoal and stuff like that. And it's just something like there's a lot of things that you'll do as an artist just uh, I don't know how, they're like exercises, you know, nudes, landscapes, whatever, you know, like most whatever of the landscapes, the I, I mean, they're not like big serious art projects or something like that, it's just something that you do all the time, just, just part of painting, uh, a lot of times, uh, now they can be, for some people they're the whole point of their art, for me they're just paintings. 
Mm -hmm. And so most of what you do as an artist is just paintings and drawings and things like that. And occasionally you'll have something in your own mind is more like a real art project or something. You know, just, uh, you know that's the difference between, say, like these, which are sketches, and uh, this guy was a model at the University of Missouri. And was reams of drawings of her, and this down here is the same place. You can see because this is a mannequin back here, it's the same mannequin, and this is a setup. And the setup, that's actually not a person. That's like a life mask. It's just propped up in the stuff, and there's a bunch of cloth and different things there. And you'll notice this foot has nothing to do with the rest of that. It's just sculpture. It's a big sculpture of a foot sitting on this block. So this is just a whole setup, just something to draw. Uh, and so these are sort of like practice stuff that you do. And it's and not this bills. This is a finished drawing. That's a, you know, that's a difference. Between yeah. So what's with this Picasso uh, posters here? Was that a influence to you, Picasso, or well, just somebody you? Lots of artists are influenced, and this was actually what was it that I was doing? It was like a reason that I had. And these are Picasso posters mostly, and, and some really good Picasso etchings. I can't remember what my, but there was something I cut out of this. She used it for something, I can't remember. First of all, the book I got for almost nothing. No, it's like $6.99. <laughs> I, I think I cut a couple pages out and gave them to students as projects, something I wanted me to just see or something that I wanted to do, wanted them to try and do something similar or something like that. Or maybe they had a piece that had that they'd already done that had some similarities and I wanted to show them how you follow through with it. And so I would cut those out. But I tell you right now, I bought the book because it was cheap. So <laughs> $8. Where were you taught? Was it St. Louis? Uh, St. Louis Art? Um, What's that? Where were you taught? What school did you go to? I went to the University of Missouri in Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri. Yeah. It was, particularly at the time, I don't know, I don't keep up with that stuff, but it was the, uh, had the probably the best art faculty, the most solid program of any place in Missouri. Mm. Private art. Yeah. State. So that's where I went to school. I didn't go to school until I was 35. When I got out of high school, I, was, uh, I went one semester. And I was just burnt out on schools. <laughs> didn't do it. And then when I was 35, I had an opportunity to go back to college, and yeah. that's where I went. What did you do between there? Had an art career. Had an art career? So you never graduated completely until... Until 1989. 1989? Yeah. Uh, yes. And that horse painting, that's yours? Yeah. My dad raised horses. And uh, so I did that painting part. Oh, ah. nice. Yeah. And that's again, that's kind of a, the painting style doesn't look like it goes with the horse, but the way it's painted, it's kind of a Rembrandt style, or whatever it is, the same kind of uh, oil, glazing, washing, build up, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, your favorite painting. This is one of my favorite paintings. There's lots of them, but this is 
just this was while I was in college and this is just a, a little study in the studio. You can see uh -huh. top of a mannequin's head. These are just junk hanging around all over in the studio. And I like that painting a lot. Okay. So what is it that makes this one one of the... My favorites? Yeah. It, it's a good composition, the palette. You know, the way all the colors and stuff work is, uh, for me, was really successful. It just was uh, turned out really nice. Again, that's another thing. That painting probably was 45 minutes or something like that. 45 minutes. Yeah. Just 45 minutes. But I was doing a lot of painting, a lot of oil painting at the time. That's an oil? oil painting on board and uh, I was doing a lot of oil painting at the time and uh, that was before was you met fast. Rembrandt or after yeah, before sure. Rembrandt before. Charles Reinhardt yeah Charles Reinhardt yeah. 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 Uh, I met after. Charles Reinhardt well actually I met him when I was a high school kid yeah. he was a close friend of an instructor of mine and uh, he came to school couple of times gave little talks and demonstrations mm -hmm. and then after high school when I was showing in a gallery and stuff I, I was seen fairly often he would come in him and his wife mm -hmm. and then in the mid 70s they would invite me to their place in Missouri in southwestern Missouri and mm -hmm. I'd go there and we would hang out for months and months and paint Let's, uh, okay. Now I am. Right now, now. As in now. Okay. These, these are um, the works that yeah. wanting to make a collection. And he saw the movie Avatar. And he said yeah. that, he said, man, that looks like Roger's, like got inspired by Roger's work, the Avatar people yeah. and the whole thing he was like he said that's Roger's stuff I mean Roger's influence you know and then he remembered the creations and he went back he said the woman's bodies the, sh the shapes the touching of the tree the nature the, the tentacles coming out he's like oh oh my gosh this is something there's a correlation where Roger's art has to be somehow seen by James Cameron. And I, I don't think that he has. What it is is uh, I think that uh, he touched into a, a theme, and these may be sort of like those uh, Jungian archetypes or something that uh, that there are strong similarities, you know, ideas or concepts, visually, kind of things. It was, uh, but yeah, it's. His movie, they talk about some of the reviews and stuff that's been kicking around. Talk about the uh, pantheism and uh, involved with the film and the characters in the film and the backdrop of that planet. And uh, that's really some of these. Now, first, I'll point out that I do a lot of different kinds of paintings or a number of different kinds of paintings, as I mentioned earlier. Lots of paintings that I do, that artists do, they're just all, it's like all practice work or something. Now, we don't think about it necessarily in terms of practice. You just do this. It's sort of, you know, you do landscapes, you do the figure drawings and paintings, you do, you know, whatever, still lifes. And these are all just things that you do, that you warm up on, and then occasionally you'll... Uh, have some theme or some kind of a thing that might you might consider or somebody might consider uh, art in parentheses and uh, but I do a couple of things and uh, one of those things is for many years now I've done these sort of earth mother 
pantheon, whatever kind of images. And uh, they actually were first inspired by your sister, my wife. And uh, because she just kind of like, there was something about her physicalness that inspired me in a certain way. So it's a lot of those kinds of the women in these are really exaggerations of her features. You know, both the body features and facial features and so on and so forth. And so the earliest things were probably some little drawings and stuff that I did, maybe in the late 60s or something. I don't know where any of those are at this point or anything about them. But then later on, uh, in the early 70s, 73, I think somewhere around in there, I done started a series of acrylic paintings that they were sort of flat in a kind of an Egyptian style that shows up in some of these. And uh, those, so I done a handful of these acrylic paintings over two or three year period of time. Of course, while I was still doing lots of other things, while I was still doing watercolors and so on and so forth. That's Italian. Yeah, this is Italian. Those you said, all these are done later. Yes. But this one here is oil. Yeah, and it's later. It was these actually, like later. I said, it's actually associated. These colors with look like acrylic colors and, and look like, but they're Now this is actually a watercolor. A watercolor, that's yeah. a watercolor. Yeah, and it's actually, this watercolor is done in a style that's more like gouache. There's a stuff that they use, illustrators would use, called gouache, and it's kind of like watercolor. It's a different binder to it than watercolor. Yeah. Watercolors like move and transparency. This, will, come this from will do this. it kind of like that too, but it's a little chalkier or whatever well, I don't right, know. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, I used it in a gouache style, uh, but it, it's really, this is a watercolor. Are you making sure that this is showing? You can always add those in. Yeah. Um, well, this is the, the one that really inspired John to want to do yeah. the work with you. Now, actually, the and strange to, part of this is, is this is only a fraction of this painting. Oh. This painting is 24 or 27 inches tall, but it's 10 feet long. And what you're seeing is, is yeah. actually, over here on this side, you see me do those kinds of things where there's some kind of glyphs and things. Yeah, they're, kind of stuff. they're like hieroglyphs. Things. Yeah, yeah. That was on this on the side. Edges, right? Then there was this whole long thing where there's an ape and stuff in the tree, and she's actually handing the ape a piece of fruit. She's got another piece of fruit in her other hand, and she's handing that to the ape. And uh, then on the other side of the ape, it's more of that kind of high width kind of thing. Oh, That's 10 okay. feet long, about 2 feet tall, or 27 inches tall, something like that. So these works here are digital fine art yeah. uh, works. And some of them are just like reproductions, and some are you change them and work them. Yes. And they've evolved. Yeah. Uh, like with, with the Italias. When you're doing that printing, you, 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 it's it's always a surprise what's going to happen when you, you know. It's to actually play. Intaglio's not that big, much of a surprise compared to paintings, really. Oh yeah. Because there's a lot more planning, it's a lot more methodical, and it takes a lot longer. So there are less surprises in the Intaglio than there are in the paintings. Oh really? So you yeah. have more control. Okay, but then when you worked on the with them on the computer then you actually put lighten up areas and, and things like that, or darken things or whatever yeah. you wanted to. Yeah. Now some of these, a lot of these, I didn't work on them. Uh, this I didn't, that painting. In fact, none of those. None of these? Actually, there were a lot of... Uh, well, what about white? Actually, the, you know, there is one in there that's done a lot. Hudson a flaming field right here. And that, that would be like that paint, that particular pamphlet was never finished. Oh. 
so I went in, I scanned it into the computer, and finished it in the computer. Okay. That's the one that you did that one. Yeah, that, and if you yeah. remember, in that brochure I made, that yeah, for the art dog yeah. brochure, yeah. this is much longer. It's like the rectangle this way. Okay. And I added things in front of it and things in back of it. Okay. So, let's see. Okay. So this one's the Italio. This is the painting. She... Yeah, this is a painting like... Uh, song for a sleeping dog. Right. And that's done in oils. And that came and after? No, that came after the That came right. after the Italian. Right. Because originally there was a small sketch that I'd done that I intended on doing the painting on a very rough little thing. And I liked the sketch a lot and done an attack of it. Now, I only recently again discovered that sketch. In fact, I didn't remember it at all until I actually seen it in an old notebook. Okay. And so I had the sketch and I'd done this. So, like, the progression of these works, um, do you know which one, like, sparked sort of, you know, there's a, like, where the ideas come from? Yeah, where, like you said, you know, the, you, you had the, the, well, that, 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 that ideals are out there, you know, and they're picked up by many artists, and now James Cameron is making something that, you know, is in a, a film that's really yeah, I highly... Don't know. I don't know that Cameron was inspired visually by anything. There are visual artists who actually made that movie look like a film. Well, right, but, so it doesn't have to be him, but, I mean, yeah. none of this was done when you were in California. No, none okay, of them. Okay, all these were done in the list. And then, do you know who owns these works anymore? I mean, what colors you went through? There's only, I think that I'll, at this time, have one painting in a gallery. Right now? Yeah, it's that painting right here. Okay. It's in a gallery in St. Louis called Three. Okay. And uh, it's been in there for several years now. Okay. And periodically, they get all the paintings on me that somebody's buying. Oh, okay. This painting's been sold probably a dozen times at least by now. <laughs> except, <laughs> okay. except I never end up with the money. They okay. Never leave, but. Okay, but all these other work, works, I, I know. Like, so, could you say some of who you think are your biggest patrons? Who's been the biggest patrons of your art? Um, like, you know, I remember that there was a owner of a restaurant who bought a lot of your bigger works um, and, and there was Balaban, a, Kathy Balaban owner, I think it's There actually was two restaurants. Two restaurants? Yeah. Balaban's had, you know, four or five watercolor paintings and uh, large watercolor paintings. And there was, a, I don't remember the folks' name anymore, but um, there was a gallery in uh, South St. Louis called uh, Jefferson Avenue Boarding House, and they had bought a number of different artworks by me, and uh, and I would hang and show in their restaurant, and that was actually the only time that I've ever hung things in a restaurant where it turned out to be lucrative. I, I sold quite a bit of art out of that restaurant. And uh, but the restaurant's no longer there. Mm -hmm. Somebody, I can't remember who, had told me within the last year or something that they think that those guys had eventually moved to California. I, I don't know. It wasn't unusual, and I don't think it's unusual for anybody to have, any artist to have. If, if somebody's buying, they like your work, a lot of times they buy numerous pieces, you know, I'd say, like, usually somebody buying a lot, five to seven pieces, that's, that's quite a bit. And, and I had, you know, 
quite a few people. There was a fellow in, uh, I can't remember his name anymore, but he was, uh, when I was very young, he was sort of a St. Louis television celebrity. He had a talk show, St. Louis talk show. I can't remember his name right off. But he had probably maybe seven to nine pieces a month. Did you, you want to go through each painting? Did you want to go through each painting? Or what do you want to add next? Cover all this? Or, um, what he wrote on the back, right? Of each of these? He wrote on the back of a sheet of paper. A sheet of paper. Well, basically just the detail. Sizes. Actually, he had stuff printed out on one side of it. I just pushed it over. Yeah. It was basically kind of the outline of what he's doing. Uh, it's still recording. On that theme that I was talking about with. Uh, that these sort of images are seem to be almost sort of young and kind of hang out. There's uh, a good example of that. Is I don't recall the guy's name, but one time in the late 70s, I seen uh, in an art magazine a show that was going on in New York of this fellow who did those same hieroglyphic sort of things. That, I mean, uncannily the same. But that's all he did. There was no images with him. It was just those mm -hmm. on canvas. And it was the same time you were making them? Oh, yeah. And I'd been making them that way for years before I'd ever seen. And I don't have no idea who that fellow was, how old he was, how long he'd been doing it. But I, without seeing his things, I had been doing that with images for quite some time by the time that uh, I'd seen his. But the part was really strange is how almost identical to what I was doing. I mean, almost character by character. And, uh, and in fact, it was uh, an artist friend of mine, abstract artist Roger White, that pointed this fellow off to me. Okay, so that was one of your questions. I just remember, Jen. Like, who were some of your peers in the art world um, that have understood your work and also, you know, help you to, you know, take the path your art's taking. Do you have any major names like that? Or? Um, as far as the flesh and blood close, you know, sort of artist folk or whatever, um, Roger White, who's in Southern California, abstract painter. Uh, he and I were close for a number of years. We went to high school together. Uh -huh. And uh, we were close for a number of, number of years and we did a lot of, uh, we would take road trips. We would drive around the country going to museums, looking at art and so on and so forth. That kind of thing. Uh, we would go to the Washington University Art Library So uh, he was very influential, and uh, now as far as did he understand what I was doing, I don't know, but I didn't even understand what I was doing at that time, so when I was a baby. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so in the literature and other art forms, has there been anyone that, you know, has led you to thinking on a certain 
journey or, or lots of people. Yeah. Do you have any major ones that any names you could? There's so many that it would be really not productive or useful to just kind of like spew them out. I mean, it, it's just is there anything? There's anything, and particularly great related to the type of painting we're not doing that we're really discussing here. Uh, there really wasn't anybody early on. I was probably because they were painting very flat and everything. I probably was uh, inspired by Egyptian art or whatever. But uh, really, there wasn't anybody doing anything. Like similar to what you were doing. Yeah, nothing so similar. Was sort of okay. Yeah, but usually that kind of thing subject matter isn't usually what is inspired, usually like, you know, techniques and different things like that. Uh, like I said, my interests have always been very diverse. I never done these type of paintings exclusively for some significant period of time. I was always doing you know, landscapes and figure things and other things.
hasn't changed. Most recently, when I was doing this uh, portrait of Deb over here, it was uh, I've done the same thing. I started like uh, doing. Well, now I don't have to go to the library. I can download the images off the internet. So I was looking at animals and stuff and downloaded a bunch of animals. And I had done, quite some time back, I'd done <coughs> a drawing in a watercolor, pretty good size, of muskox some time back. And so I ran across some more muskox images, downloaded them, blah, 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 and anyway, then, then mixed them in. And uh, I think it was because I'd gone online looking for pigs. <laughs> and, you know, so one animal leads to the next, so to speak. So did you ever, like, see a wild boar in person? Or do yeah. you have any, yeah. like... Yeah. I was, uh, when I was, um, let's see, this would have been 68 or 69, 1968 or 1969, somewhere in there. I worked for a short while at the uh, stockyards in East St. Louis, Illinois. And I herded pigs around. Oh. And uh, being rather low on the seniority totem pole, uh, I would get the the job of of moving boars. And uh, sometimes they were big domestic boars, and other times they were wild boars, mostly from Arkansas, the classic Razorback or whatever. And so I would be up close and personal with them and stuff like that. The main thing to remember about the boars, whether they're the wild boars or the domestic ones, in temperament there's not that much difference between the wild boars and the domestic ones, strangely enough. They look a lot different. But the temperament's the same. They can be really mean, they are really fast, unbelievably fast. And all those tusks are razor sharp. So it, that was a, you know, so the sort of temperament is what I recall the most from those. Okay. So then uh, you also worked like on the barges and you've done a lot of um, adventurous kind of things like I didn't that. seem all that adventurous at, <laughs> at, adventurous at the time. But yeah, it was, uh, I worked a lot of different jobs and some of them pretty weird. Uh, river boats, I worked on river boats for a few years. Uh, when I was married to Tina, and uh, and in fact, I when she died is when I quit working on river boats because then I had to take care of April, and uh, I'd have probably quit shortly thereafter, no matter what happened. But it was yeah, I worked for a few years on river boats. Mm -hmm. And then um, you're in the Clean County now, and you're teaching at. Just an, an occasional class, a class every semester or whatever they want to call it, season. Uh, I, you know, usually have a class in the summer, class in the fall, class in the spring. And uh, I taught uh, like a regular watercolor class. And uh, then I did a portrait figure watercolor class. And then uh, upcoming now, I have a life drawing class that I'm going to be doing in, in a couple of months. And you also taught at Eureka for a while? Yeah, taught at Eureka for a little while. Uh, introduction design courses, you know, nothing real streamlined or anything. And in fact, the, the interesting thing about that was that uh, from the time I was in high school, I always liked in studios, I liked helping people with their projects or or whatever was going on. And uh, my main high school art teacher uh, was always trying to talk me into like going to college to become a art teacher. And uh, for some reason, people always around me always assumed I'd be a great art teacher. Well, <clears throat> having a chance to teach art in college. I actually don't like it. <laughs> I still like working in studios with other people and helping people do their projects, making suggestions, meaningful critiques. And I like um, 
I like teaching at the, and I've done a lot of this over the years, uh, teaching at uh, local community colleges or someplace like the Wayne County Art Center. Uh, I like getting classes where people are <clears throat> not beginners, but are sort of intermediate, and they already have a fair amount of drawing skills and so on and so forth. And I like to talk to them to go past the blocks that they get. Because I've had them, everybody, they're just a natural part of I like to help them move past that intermediate stage because it's, it's pretty important, and uh, and I think I'm I'm pretty good at that. I can spot usually I can identify what they run up against and a way past it, uh, so, and that's what I enjoy is that more than just a big group of students that are there because they needed a class a second hour or whatever it was going on. Seemingly later, yes. Yeah, but you were still working out and, and, and growing. Yeah. That's what I would say. I, I kind of done it totally backwards, and it was because of, you know, going in, mm -hmm. you did formal Let's training. Let's get the yeah. waiting on you. Okay. I should have, we should have had this on the tape. You should have. John, that was like, but you know what? I well, think it is that on that, paper, you know, or it's recording still. It is, even though there's no picture? That about? I missed the earlier part. Okay, well, whatever. I was just saying that um, just as somebody who's an art appreciator, looking and being interested in your art all along, you know, that's what I sort of noticed about things. And it was uh, when I was uh, young in high school, 
Um, it was actually difficult for me to take instruction from anybody. And there was, uh, because I, I was kind of pig-headed and obsessed and different things. It, it's difficult to describe the things that was going on. But it was, uh, and most of the time that didn't hurt very much. There was a couple times, there were some things like uh, uh, very early on, was that when the, I can't remember if she was a high school teacher, or in the school that one semester I went when I got out of high school. Did you come oh. off a bad instructor or something like that? No, 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 I was a bad student. I didn't oh. really have bad instructors that oh. much. In high school, there were some, before Harvey Miller showed up, who was a, a real professional artist and teacher, uh, the people that were teaching the high school classes were pretty lackluster. It, they were not inspirational at all. And, uh, but when Harvey Miller came in, I, probably within two or three weeks of seeing him work, and I knew what I wanted to do from then on. So it was so that was a, a, a big difference. But it was I had certain like almost kind of inherent talents, yeah. mostly around drawing and mostly around my ability to sort of respond to things. That's why I liked watercolor and stuff, because watercolor would do it most of the work for you. You know, put some color and some water on here and it starts doing things. And then I could respond to what it did and sort of then help it, uh -huh. you know, along, you know, shape the thing as it went. Uh -huh. And then my drawing style was similar. It was just... So you were like a process-centered artist. You let the process reveal things to you, and then you took from there and directed yeah. and created. Yeah, without thinking a lot about it. This is a very autonomic kind of a, a process. I'd just be in there kind of doing it. And so, and, and that right there is sort of autonomic, I'd just be in there doing it, was the, both the, the good thing and the bad thing. The good side of it was it worked well for me. So I did some really nice things and it made, for me, it made art exciting. Uh, but at the same time, it made it to where I couldn't really take instruction I mean, it was just like pulling teeth trying to learn, you know, trying to take a drawing instruction on how to draw a body or something like that, or how to shape things with color. And it just, it was just, uh, I, I couldn't adhere to discipline, okay. is right. what it was. Uh -huh. And so I had you to... had to grow up. I had definitely had to grow up. That was it. I mean, that was the whole ball of wax right there. And it took me a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm slow on growing up and may never get there, who knows, so. And then being near a major um, art museum like the St. Louis Art Museum, um, did you take advantage of that? Was that a yeah. place where you spent um, studying masters and our modern artists or? Now, the St. Louis Art Museum at the time, when I was in high school in the 60s, was uh, dominated by plates. It was like they had huge collections of plates. I still, ceramic, to this day, plates. yeah, dinnerware. Okay. I mean, they would have whole rooms set up just like, you know, that was 1849 and we were having din din with 80 guests or something. And have all these rooms set up with plates mm -hmm. and stuff like that and it was like they had what time it was in the this is mid 60s okay mid 60s yeah and uh so there were a lot of problems with that they they had great art that they didn't even put on the walls i mean curators there just they were interested in plates and they had big plate shows and stuff like that but it used to be that they had, once a year, they had a regional show where artists from the Midwest would enter this thing. And this was just, I mean, for me, uh, as a young artist, I mean, this was just magic. You would see real people doing real things. There was just, it was incredible. 
And of course, by the late 60s, they decided to just stop that altogether, I guess, as eating into their plate thing. I don't know. It's, it's pretty weird. But that's over with now. I mean, I'm sure you can still see plates down there, but they have, uh, you know, they have one of the greatest, I mean, if not the greatest Max Beckman collection that there is. And they, you know, they've, they've got a lot of, they've got a lot of stuff and they show it. And, uh, but that's the way it was. Where I really got was that show and some other, actually, Midwest art shows that I would go to. Uh, that was a lot more inspirational. And then by the end of the 60s or something, was when I would start going over to the art library at Washington University, which they, their art school has its own library. And it was just, it was candy. It was just really, so I could read essays by people, you know, their thoughts about art and all these different things uh, that, were, that were pretty important. Actually, that eventually led, I, I was able to become more disciplined later on I was not only getting older but there was a lot of things that I seen and read there in the art libraries and stuff that would interest me intellectually and would make me kind of put my words in Shall we Yeah. 
Something mogul, something mogul is what the name of that company is. Company is. Anyway, so. Um, well, we could, I think it's So while you were doing these other um, creative endeavors, but that had commercial yeah. uh, value to them, were you able to also uh, create fine art during that time? Sporadically. Sporadically. Yeah. And then. Um, I know for a fact that you write some pretty good poetry, <laughs> and that you did a long time ago, I guess, songs. You, you wrote, wrote songs. lyrics. You wrote lyrics yeah. and songs. Yeah. And, uh, and you composed music, too, with a yeah. folk Very kind primitive. of bluesy kind yeah. of folky sound. Bluesy folky kind of thing, blues right? kind, of, kind of sound yeah. to it. But later evolved into more jazzy kind more of things, yeah, yeah. but yeah, for most of it was. Mm -hmm. The thing about, and the thing about that was, uh, I don't know if I ever mentioned it to you, but um, a friend of mine who uh, was living in San Francisco, who originally I grew up with in the Midwest, was living in San Francisco. He had taped some of my things that I played. And uh, he happened to live with this, and I'm really bad on names, but the guy was the producer for... A major producer or oh, he was a major producer. Oh, yeah. He was, uh, uh, I'm thinking like, I think I remember Buddy, this when it happened. Buddy Miles. Uh, Some famous guy wanted you to record music. This, there was actually two guys, and this was one of them. And he was a famous producer for, you know, you know, big name. Uh -huh. I'm thinking it was like Buddy Miles, Aretha Franklin, yeah. and, and then Tower of Power, which was a on the West Coast was a really popular Latin band, more so than Santana. It was, in fact, a lot of the guys from Santana and Tower of Power, Power uh -huh. would be going back and forth uh -huh. all the time, depending on who was like on tour or whatever. Uh -huh. And so uh, this guy was producer of Tower of Power and different things like that. I have no idea what his name is, can't even begin to recall. But uh, my friend had played my tapes and stuff and this guy wanted to wanted me to come back and come to San Francisco and, and do some recording or something but uh, I was really afraid to because I wasn't really a musician I was just some clown that pounded around on you know guitar and stuff I knew musicians and I knew the difference between real musicians and the, the sort of thing that I did but, you know, and the guy said, well, I've got musicians. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't do it. And uh, then once in the early 70s when I was living in San Francisco, this is, I got the Tower of Power thing wrong. It wasn't that other guy. He didn't have a connection to Tower of Power. It was this fellow I was working for, uh, really just moving tie-dyed shirts in Northern California go out, have a route, and drop them off and stuff. And he uh, he was the manager for Tower of Power. That's where Tower of Power came in. 
and he told me, now this is in 1971 or 72, and he said that uh, he wanted me to do some recordings. I'm going, I don't know. And uh, he said he had $30,000 that he would spend to for me to make. Take a take. He, he was an American something. Idol guy. He had somebody he, he <laughs> without even going to TV. <laughs> it's like, and he just. But again, you know, the same as all with the other. But films. you were always, you always saw yourself as a visual artist, not a performing artist. You could, yeah, you couldn't a, conceive there, of yourself as a performing artist. More there was a number. It was kind of like something that you did for fun or something. Because I, I went to your performances. I was. The little girl who's you know, yeah, it was something that with, just for my own uh, self entertainment and things mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. and it's like, uh, and I thought of myself more as professional, professional wise as like a painter or something, mm -hmm. and you don't want to like, I didn't really want to give up my own private little thing, and like I said, I mean, I I had close friends that were musicians, and I knew the difference between me and them, and I wasn't a musician, but. Those guys knew that I wasn't a musician, and as the one fellow said, I've got musicians, you know, and it was, uh, they were interested in just the sort of weird creative side of what I was doing. It was probably, hindsight was a really good thing that I didn't do. I probably, because if I had been successful, I had too much money, and I probably killed myself <laughs> on the <sex> drugs. <laughs> Up I'm serious. I mean, yeah. I was Tiger Woods. I was, Tiger Woods. You ended up like I Tiger Woods. Oh, I made Tiger Woods look like a wimp. <laughs> I mean, he didn't even my bitch. Yeah, I didn't even nothing. Okay. I gotta go to the bathroom. Now this is what I call pickle juice. Drink no pickles before they're time. <laughs> <laughs> That's good wine. And he left? This wine is from Australia. And so that is true pickles. Pickles from, from Taiwan.